was a question last time if you have a bunch of vectors in the Hilbert space, can you always pick a basis such that only finitely many coefficients are non zero? And um, in general, that's not possible. That was correct what I said, but what was not correct was me trying to make a point with just two vectors, because two vectors always lie in a plane, and obviously you can find a basis such that you have just two non vanishing coefficients, and for one you can just have one non vanishing one. Um, this became an exercise actually <laughs> yeah, for the quantum computer science course. Um, Okay, basically I will continue with what we did last time. We have to speed up a bit. It's um, a lot of stuff I'd like to cover and ideally I would like to finish with the functional analysis part today, but I probably will need a bit more time. Um, so let's see how far we get. Um, I think we stopped roughly Using these different classes of operators, self adjoint, unit tree, and um, I would like to continue there. So, the first observation that we'll need, which is important, is that the self adjoint operators form a vector space. And that's a real vector space. And the point is just um, that. talking about um, the algebra B of H of all bound operators on Hilbert space, but I will see that this discussion um, translates without any extra effort to um, other algebras also, which will be fine later on. So if you have two such operators, then self-adjoint and moreover if you have a real number then of course r times k is self-adjoint and this of course implies that you get a real vector space there you cannot put a complex number there obviously because this would not give you so that you can immediately check. Anyway, you get a vector space, so um, as, uh, I actually would like to write this with a small index S A sub joint. Um, that's a vector space. thing you may ask, is this also an algebra? And um, the other message is, it is not unless um, you look at commuting operators. So it's, it's a very small lemma, it's almost trivial. So the lemma says, See that well. Um, the proof is, is just form A B star. One of the properties of star. This is B star A star. Because we assume that A and B are self-adjoint, we have B A. This, of course, is just A B if you can commute them. So that's all. It's very trivial, but it means that self-adjoint operators do not form an algebra. <coughs> So this is something um, you will not do, and also in physics you will usually not multiply physical quantities because such a 
transaction operators represent physical quantities. What you do have is, is um, a Lee bracket, basically this is already spawning in this direction, it will not go there for the moment. Okay, um, of course if you do that space it's just one dimensional, but that's trivial then you get an algebra, which is uh, cortex numbers. So another thing that's just useful to know, I basically um, today I'll present lots of things that are useful to know and that um, you may know for P of H and then uh, we see generalization to other settings, maybe you don't know the stuff, then this is usually um, good to know. And one of these things is that um, if you have an operator, you can always decompose it into a sum of self adjoint ones. So there's another lemma which says um, well, so this, this way, let T in B of H there um several channel operators T one and T two H S A such that T is T1 plus I times T2. So this is very reminiscent of complex numbers which have the real part and an imaginary part. Something very similar works for um, operators and the proof again is this one line. But you can check this so I'll give you um, T1 and T2 in terms of T. Just define T1 as, uh, get this right, as 1 half T plus T star, and T2 is minus I half T minus T star. I mean, if you check that those are self joint operators and that they are, well, this sum. I times the second one gives you back T. Okay, in this sense, you can also say that self adjoint operators generate um, for the algebra of bound operators. Okay, the next big thing that plays an important role um, in well, function analysis, but also in the topos approach, are projection operators, and this is a very geometric aspect of the theory, so I'll try to, to give you some kind of geometric intuition of what's going on there. Um, the first thing we want to talk about are closed subspaces and orthogonal complements um, that they have. So that U be contained with H be closed. statement is, well it's very simple to see, um, we can define an orthogonal complement for this space and of course you need the inner product to do so. You want another subspace such that in this other subspace um, you have all the vectors which are orthogonal to all vectors in U. So, um,
to look at our operators, which is something very simple. They just send each x to u. Well, not to the same u, but each x to that part of x that lies within the subspace u. And um, those operators are called orthogonal projections. So um, we define um, P from H to H by, uh, well, this one I should write in English and just gibberish where to put it. Um, so change, so it's an idempotent operator, which is expressed here, and um, also you get um, that u is given as, well, first of all, all the px for x and h, of course, but this is also the set of all y and h such that Py equals y. So that's the idea about a projection is a certain subspace, a closed subspace is just mapped to itself and the orthogonal complement is mapped to the zero vector. Um, that's the geometric idea about that and these two Expressions here show you how to go back and forth um, between the projections and the closed subspaces. So from every projection you get a closed subspace, but also from every closed subspace which you just put in here, because we assume we have this decomposition into u plus v, you get a projection p. And um, this actually contains more structure, which is quite important. Um, and the structure is easier to see on the level of the subspaces, but because we can go back and forth, um, that's our freedom to choose where we look first. So, you know if you have two subspaces, you can form the intersection, we're talking about closed subspace, you get another closed subspace. Actually, even if you have an arbitrary family of closed subspaces, you can form the intersection, you get um, closed subspace. You can also take, well you cannot just take the union of a family of closed subspaces because this will not be a linear space at all, but you can look at what they span, which will give you a subspace, and then in general you have to take the closure because the span in itself will not be closed. But this means you can generate um, a new subspace from family in two ways, either by intersection or by the closure of the span. And um, these are actually lattice operations, which means um, the, the intersection is a greatest lower bound with respect to the partial order on subspace, which is simply given the following way. You say um, subspace is partially ordered. So we have, let's say, u1 is smaller than 2 if um, and only if u1 is just contained in u2. Again, it's a geometric thing going on here. Um, so with respect to this partial order, you can look for greatest law of bounds and least upper bounds, and these are exactly the things I described, so let's write this down. 
Um, so let's call the subspaces. Let's see. S of H is the at this level is the set. Or we already said it's a pole set. Let's say it's the pole set of closed subspace. And this and it becomes a lattice. Join of the UI as the closure of the span of this whole family UI. Let's say I is from some index set I. So that's here, it's the same index set, of course. <coughs> Since we have this bijection with projections, we can translate all this structure to projections, and projections also form a lattice. And it's even a complete lattice. So I should actually say it's this pen is not very good. I'll try to find another one. Um, it's a complete lattice because we have arbitrary means and joints. Just say translate uh, translates to projections, and so the projections also form a complete lattice. Form um, lattice. In fact. I didn't talk about that, I'll talk about this later, probably not today. Um, there are orders on side the joint operators. One thing you find in all the books is called linear order. And this uh, gives you an order, a partial order, this means of course on projections also. Um, and the letter structure I get and the partial order I get from this subspace construction coincides with the one I get from the linear order. It also coincides with um, a partial order you get in a different way, which is not so well known. There's a sort of spectral order on set of joint operators. But if you just look at projections, it coincides with the linear order. So on this level, um, we also have um, the same, so it fits nicely with what you do in subspaces. The spectral order will actually play a certain role in our formalism later on, but I'll introduce this. Um, a bit later. So um, we get this, and um, of course, you have that a projection is smaller than another one precisely if the corresponding subspaces are in this relation. So oh. the first projection projects onto a smaller subspace than the other one. And, and it's of course possible to express these lattice operations for projections also, but this is quite a bit more complicated actually, um, and this is why it's easier to look at subspaces. So, um, there are different equivalent ways of expressing this partial order of projections. I'll show you at least one thing. You have that P is smaller equal to Q, uh, is equivalent to PQ is Q. The product um, comes out as the one thing I put in, then the one thing that comes out is the smaller one. And geometrically, that's very clear. If you project onto a bigger subspace and then project onto a smaller one, it's like projecting onto the smaller one right away. Or if you first project onto the smaller one and then project onto the larger one, it's, it's also the same. So it's also very clear. Um, other useful relations are the following. This, is, this will also be used, and uh, I think it's quite handy to know it. 
if you have the join of a family of the form 1 minus pi, oh, I should say something which I forgot to say. Um, it's indicated here. This, of course, is a lattice which has an auto complement because for every subspace you get the uh, orthogonal complement. And this is, well, this is like, um, well, it behaves like uh, negation in, in logic. We'll interpret these things later on logically. Basically, means you have, um, um, I don't have written down the list of properties here in case maybe you apply. Um, complement twice, you get back to where you started, and then the, it reverses the order and, and the usual properties. All this also applies to projections, of course, and the orthogonal complement of projection is just 1 minus the projection. So if P projects onto some subspace, then 1 minus P projects onto the orthogonal complement. And 1 is the identity operator, and is of course itself a projection, it's just a projection onto the whole space. Okay, so um, this means you will have expressions of this form sometimes because they relate to the orthogonal complement. It's useful to know that this is 1 minus the join, no, sorry, the, the meet i pi. It's not very hard to see for subspaces. There's an analogous relation if you swap the roles of joins and meets here. The other way around too. And finally, um, also let me write this here. Well, this only applies if two projections commute if P and Q commute, then I can express the meet and the join of the two in terms of the other algebraic operations, namely P. Join Q is P plus Q, but we may this this may be too big because they may overlap, so to say. So I have to subtract where they overlap. So I have to write minus Q P P Q. This this doesn't matter the order here and the the meet. This only applies if they commute. If they don't commute, the product of two projections is not projection in general. You can generate quite a lot of complicated stuff from two non commuting projections. Um, okay. One very important thing about this lattice. These two lattices, these two isomorphic lattices, is that they are non distributive. And uh, we need some space for that. It's something we have to, to look at. This plays a major role once we want to interpret these things um, in a logical way. So, what I mean is the following um, projection lattice is non well, if the dimension of H is larger than one. So, um, in all interesting situations, that's true. Um, and it means that P, well, it's actually, it doesn't matter which one to do P. So you have three projections in your form P and Q, or, well, I'm already reading this in a logical way. Say P meet Q join R. This is in general not the same as P meet Q. Say it works in all other spaces of dimension at least two, 
So we should be able to do it on the whiteboard if we can. Just look at three one dimensional projections P, Q, R. And if you have seen this before, then it's very instructive to look at this. So Q join R is well, the subspace generated by the two is the whole whiteboard. P and Q join R is the intersection of this one dimensional subspace with the whiteboard, so it's the full line. On the other hand, P meet Q is just the null vector space, the origin. Likewise, P and R is also just this, so the join is just null vector space, which is obviously different from the line. And this is Centrally important in quantum theory, if you look at it in a logical way, we see that it relates directly to non commutativity and things like that, and it relates directly to uh, logical aspects of the theory. Um, Birkhoff and von Neumann suggested to use the lattice of projections um, as, as giving us a logic for quantum systems. And the idea was to use um, the means as a logical. And, and the joins is logical or you run into all kinds of trouble and uh, I think the most severe one is actually the fact that it's a non-distributive lattice which makes it very very hard to give any kind of sensible interpretation or semantics to this kind of logic and in my view at least this has failed um, it is very fruitful in, in other aspects, and we'll see some aspects of that. Um, it's a lot of nice geometry hiding here, it's projective geometry obviously, and um, this is very interesting, but in logical terms um, it's very hard to make sense of this if you want to interpret it that way. But it's good to know what was there, um, and that one can look at things that way. Um, now, it is true, of course, that you can look at distributive sublattices of the lattice of projections. So you look at a certain collection of projections which do form a lattice and which behave distributively. So these obviously don't, but it's very easy to check that if you have a set of commuting projections, from the lattice. This is a distributive lattice. So this is a small exercise. Write this down. You use these two relations, and you see very, very in a very straightforward way. It's three lines that if all the projections commute, you get a distributive lattice. You get equality here. And likewise, I should have said that you can swap the roles. So you need a join, and you have a similar formula. But actually, you can use one from the other. So it's, it's enough to write down one. And moreover, every projection is contained in a distributive lattice. So very trivially, you have um, for all
it's very useful to say at this point. This may give the wrong impression that you can just cut up projection lattice into can just cut up projection lattice into distributive parts and then within this distributive part of things nice and fine. That's not true. The, the problem is that the distributive sub lattices are interwoven, if you like. Yeah, you, you can't they do not do not just lie side by side, uh, nicely sorted out. The, the fact is that every projection lies in many different distributive sub lattices. So there's a lot of information in um, how the distributive sub lattices relate to each other. And we will see this later on, as I said. Distributive lattice projections gives you an abelian algebra, which will be a phenomenal algebra, in fact. And this is one aspect that we formalize in the topos approach, namely, you look at abelian subalgebras, which may be very simple minded, but crucially, you um, formalize how they lie within each other and how they relate to each other. And this is an important so, so let's say in three dimensions you have um, an orthonormal basis, and you can, of course, let's say, keep this projection fixed and rotate around it, then this particular projection and its orthogonal complement rely on all these subalgebras that I get for all these different bases. And this is how they relate to each other. And um, if I keep track of these relations, I keep track of a lot of uh, what's going on in my algebra. Okay. Um, We'll see this later, as I said. Uh, now, it's a good time, I think, to define C star algebras. We will just see the very, very basic aspects. Or, um, well, it's not just basic stuff that we'll see, but I'll prove nothing. That's, that, that's the point. I um, just give you the, the main results that I think you will need and some idea how these things relate to you stuff that you know probably and uh, if you want to know where you can find it, it's, um, you can always ask me, I basically only used case and rules at one point, we got from duality, um, I'd say a bit more but it's very easy to find. So uh, I think this is absolutely wonderful, so C style. the idea that A be complex. So these were the guys we looked at last time and we also had um, for the case of B of H uh, these adjoints and this gives us um, abstractly what's called an involution. So
crucial this property because it um, gives us the link between the involution and the norm. So this links the, the two structures that I have in the Banach algebra. I have the norm, and I have this additional element, the involution. This is how they relate to each other. And this fixes a whole lot of stuff for us, which was a bit, well, you could say, too general in Banach algebra. We have the situation the spectrum of an operator could depend on the algebra. This will not be the case anymore. It all comes down to this. Um, we will also see right away um, that we get a nice notion of morphisms. First, let me say, once we have this, which of course is abstracted from the Hilbert space situation, um, we can immediately talk about things like, well, adjoints obviously, they're just there. Um, self adjointness unitary operators, all these things are there. There's, there's nothing extra to do because we just use the um, evolution. Um, so, thinking categorically, having objects, we'd like to have morphisms. So, what are the arrows between C star algebras? Um, the so called star homomorphisms. means it's a linear map, preserves the multiplication, and it sends the identity in A to the identity in B. I should make this explicit actually, it's a complex part of the graph. We assume, this is not strictly necessary, that we always have a unit element in our C-star algebras. You can do lots of stuff, you can look at C-star algebras without unit elements, you can join unit elements and all these things, but we'll avoid this. So we always assume our system of us have unit elements and um, you can find more general stuff in the literature. Um, and there's an algebra homomorphism such that well it preserves the extra structure that we have. Five A star is five A star. Interestingly, you see no condition of continuity in all these things, but this follows from the C star property because this links the norm and the involution. So this already implies continuity in the norm topology. There is something to prove there, of course, but um, basically it comes down to the C star property, so you have um, star Like we have a category now, objects, C star mass, arrows, star homomorphisms. Examples. First example is um, X B compact. House of space. It always means pointwise uh, algebraic operations. Is C under evolution uh, was very simple. Um, uh, let's well, F goes to F star and F star X is defined to be F X um, for X. So just Second example. 
example, um, is of course just b of h. For now we know these two examples, we'll see that they are typical. As I said, we already saw the same examples for Barnard algebras. And I'll just introduce more structure. It's of course by no means uh, true that the only C star algebras would be B of H. There are vastly many different C star algebras, um, but currently we just have this example. Um, this, of course, is an abelian algebra, while well, this is not. Okay. I already said, uh, I don't think I have to write this down, maybe I write it down quickly. But he said that in C star algebras, the spectrum does not depend on the algebra anymore. Last time we saw this at this point, so let's formulate this. There is a proposition of the following kind um, that A. and A is automatic, and B is automatically in A, uh, we have that the spectrum of this operator A with respect to the algebra B is the same as the spectrum of A with respect to A. And since we are just interested in C star algebras from now on, we just drop the index, we can speak of the spectrum of because we at least have C star algebras. Um, we will not go back to the level of generality of Banach algebras. So that's nice. Um, the, okay, spectrum, and we have something else which is good to know. Um, it's the following you can apply functions to operators. This actually is quite a big topic in itself. Which kind of functions can I apply to an operator in a C star algebra to get another operator in the same algebra? And, um, for C star algebras, the right kind of functions are continuous functions. So um, we we'll see this briefly, just show you how the spectrum behaves if you apply a function, a continuous function. So um, this is a proof, it's a theorem. Um, self-adjoint um, and moreover we have um, f is a continuous function on the spectrum of a then the spectrum of f of a is equal to well, f of t such that function to uh, the elements of the spectrum of A and you get the spectrum of F of A. It is not quite, well something very similar will be true for for non algebra so I haven't written this down. They have to take care, usually you have to take the closure of, of the image. And um, lots of technicalities hiding here. I want to emphasize one thing at this point. We will, um, in the talks about later, talk about coarse graining ideas. I mean, this is a bit too early to, to say this now, but um, it is very much related to, to what's happening here. You take an operator and then you take a function of it. And um, let's say the operator is self adjoint, so uh, as it is here, it's physically, it represents the physical quantity. and. Um, Let's say in the simplest case, you have some, 
some scale um, where you have point to point into this and now you can um, build another meshing apparatus and which um, measures maybe not the same same thing you just re-gauge your scale maybe you um, make it a bit coarser in the sense that you cannot distinguish quite as good as before where the pointer is pointing so let's assume the pointer points to action elements in the spectrum of the operator. So applying a function is like forming a new, uh, less precise scale. This is this coarse graining idea. And of course, if you have something which is more exact, you can always go to something which is less exact. And this will happen in particular if your function f is not injective. So things you could distinguish before in the spectrum of, of A cannot in general distinguish later on because f may map two values to the same thing. So that's always a natural way of looking um, from the, the more precise, more refined situation to the less refined situation. This will be behind the important choice we have to make at some point. We have to decide at some point whether we would like to look at covariant functors or contravariant ones. Um, as I said, this, this will become much clearer later on. But it has to do with this very simple thing happening here. And coarse grain, well, functions in general are not injective, so they are one way streets. Mm -hmm. And so you have to follow the one way street. If you want to go the other way, you have to explain conceptually why this is a good idea. Uh, did you define f of a before at some point? Sorry? f of a is, is an element. Oh, I didn't, I didn't actually right? say what this is. Yes, I, this, is, this is actually. Um, as it points to uh, quite a, a big part of theory. Think of this as um, a continuous function being approximated by the poly polynomial. And you can form a polynomial uh, in your algebra. That's not a problem. Then you have to think carefully about how to form limits. And then you can apply continuous functions to, to operators. That's what's going on here. So it's a very good question. Actually, this is um, um, part of the so-called function calculus, and for each kind of algebra, you have different kind of function calculus, and basically, it's the, the class of function that you can apply here. And for C star algebras, these are continuous functions. So it's because of the stone weistrass theorem that you can approximate all yeah. of them by polynomials, and yes. polynomials we know how to apply to operators. Yes, and that's exactly the point. And then we take the limit of that yes, yes. in the algebra. Yeah. 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 It's a good question, but this is um, something I don't want to talk about too much. Um, let's see, maybe it's a good time to take a break. Um, let, me, let me see. Yeah, I think it's a good time to take a break. So let's say 10 minutes. I strongly hope I get to girlfriend reality. Let me see. Okay. This is bad, it's just too much stuff. Um, so, the idea is we want to talk about linear functionals. But before we can do so, we have to talk about another class of operators. Um, so, let's do this very quickly. Let A be C star algebra. in there, it's called A in A is positive um, if the spectrum of A is entirely contained in R. So, yes, this is actually R. Since we have bounded operators, this must be an actual inclusion, actually. Okay, um, there are different ways of checking whether an operator is positive. So, um, we have the following equivalent. A is in, well, this is A is in A plus. I don't have to explain this. A plus just means a set of positive operators. 
operators in your C standard world. It actually is a column, as you can see easily. This is equivalent to um, several things. A equals H squared for some positive operator. Um, so this H A plus is also equivalent to um, A is B star. Just means you can yeah, okay. perform the square root of yeah, yeah. positive operator. Yeah. This is what this actually says. Yeah. Um, this immediately tells you that projections are positive, which you can easily see because the spectrum of projection obviously is zero and one, unless it's the zero projection is just zero or the identity is just one. But every non-trivial projection has as its spectrum zero one, and um, this is equivalent to um, the following if you have, well, in this special situation, if A is a sub algebra of E of H, then this is also equivalent to um, for all X in H, you have that the inner product of X with A and X is partially equal to zero. This is a condition we saw before. Okay, these are positive operators, and now we can say what positive linear functions are. So now we want to map from our algebra into the uh, complex numbers in a linear way, and um, this will just be a linear function. What we want a bit more is to say what a positive linear function is, um, and the condition there is well, it maps every positive operator to a positive real number. that um, for all a in a plus we have row of a not equal to zero. Um, if row over is normalized, which of course just means Say that I'll write it down. A linear function is positive if and only if it is bounded, and the norm of rho is equal to um, rho of 1. So, this is one way of characterizing positive linear functions. And I'll give you an example. Thank you. 
This is a At this point, should it sensible to say why are we doing all this in, in terms of physics? So we're slowly getting there to, to have the pieces in place. So what we are developing, at least uh, in an outline, is the mathematical machinery we need to describe non-relativistic quantum theory, but not just saying our oh, algebra is all bounded operators, but is allowed to exist. Can restrict such a vector state also to um, smaller algebras than the of H. And when physicists say a vector in Hilbert space is a state, that's what they actually mean. Because a vector obviously is not a state in this sense, but you get a state in this sense. It is actually very misleading when you think about it that physicists always write their states with this notation and say this is a quantum state. And you see this all the time. This actually is a vector in Hilbert space. The, the state, I think, is this guy. So in one and a half hours I will be lecturing on quantum computer science. People will tell people this is a state of those few uh, here. Mm -hmm. uh, the actual state is this guy. Because this acts and gives you... Even this is not entirely true. The actual state is... well. Let's make this precise. Once I want to, uh, at least once I want to say this. So that the actual state is, is of course, this guy. Here's the slot. So, because here you can put your operator, and then you get a complex number. And this is kind of misleading. Of course, the, the connection is here. It's very straightforward. But that's what's actually happening in physics. And it was also not correct to say that this is this, this is just um, this is just the other half of it, if you like, the grass and the cats. So anyway, um, this is an example, and these states are very important. There are lots of other states, of course, um, but the things we call mathematically states actually also can be interpreted physically as states of a quantum system. So that's that's the mathematical entity that, that describes how your quantum system is. Well, as Chris Eichen likes to say, there are lots of problems with the word is in that sentence because it's very hard to say how a quantum system is. Um, but that much later. And of course, uh, why we talk about algebras and some joint elements in particular so much? Because they describe the physical quantities of a quantum system. And unitary operators, or more precisely one parameter families of unitary operators, they describe how your system the state of your system changes in time, so it's from time evolution. So all these things have a meaning in physics. Projections have a big meaning, which we will see next time, I guess. Um, so all these things are there for a reason. There's nice mathematics in itself, but it's not um, why we do it. We want to apply this in physics. It's just a level more general than what you usually see in the first course of quantum physics. Okay, um, yes, I think I can do it. So, um, let's skip this and just say this. It's all on the slides. I'll send around the slides. Um, I can do this later today. By the way, I'm, I'm very interested if you have any, if you find any typos and stuff. So, this is bound to have typos. So, I'm not very grateful if you. Let me know. Um, you can show that if you have some A in your algebra, it's at least normal. But let's say you have a subject on operator, it's enough for us to look at. And you have 
that psi limit A and the spectrum of A can always find a state such that well, the rho in let's call the state space S of A such that rho applied to A gives you this particular element in the spectrum. That's always possible. You can even show you can always find a so-called pure state, that's what I want to define now, um, that has this property. So what's a pure state? Um, like topologies on this, there, there is a natural topology on this set called the weak star topology. Um, this will lead us too far. Um, I'll just tell you that this is closed in this topology and um, it's the weak star closed convex hull of um, Extreme point. So, what's the what's the idea? If you have a convex set, again, this is of course a very coarse picture, which doesn't imply there's a lot of different uh, difficult geometry going on here. But very roughly, if you have a convex set in the plane, you can get to any point here in the middle by forming such convex combinations of elements on the outside, so to say. If your topology is of a suitable kind, if it's a locally complex topology, then um, a set which is um, convex is generated in this sense by its extreme points. First of all, it has extreme points, and you can get the whole set in a way very similar to what I indicated here as, a, um, as what you can generate from the extreme points. So we just define uh, what this some topology going on here, which I not even sketch. The extreme points of S of A are called pure states. Exactly the pure states. These vector states are exactly the pure states. This is another reason why physicists, uh, well, physicists always say vector states are pure states. That's true if you think of this algebra. It's not true if you think of a general C star algebra can have other pure states. Um, but what of the vector states in a general C star algebra? Is there, is there a I don't think they always are pure states, but I would have to check this. Um, you can, of course, restrict them, as I said, to any C algebra, so they give you states, but I don't think they are necessarily pure. Um, no, I meant, so where are the vectors coming from in that case? Um, another good question. This is basically because we have representation theorem for C algebras that they always can be represented faithfully oh, as okay. a sub element of E of H, and then you have a little space in the game. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It's just five minutes, that's actually a very 
short, but um, okay. at least show you the theorem because that's actually the central theorem of dependency algebra. So we we'll now specialize the situation of the dependency algebras, and uh, we can learn a lot about them. And I saw an important theorem there. So. Um, Is non zero linear function on the billion C star algebra A is a pure state. very easy, it's a nice characterization, but it's a very strong result. It implies the following. It implies immediately um, for all objections in our algebra, we have that, um, well, let's apply it. The lambda of p, this is lambda of p squared, because projectors are important. This is multiplicative, so this is lambda of p squared. And this, of course, then must lie in this sense, either 0 or 1. Again, this will play a major role later on if we interpret things logically. So I can say this right now, if a projection represents a certain proposition about a physical system, then this assigns a truth value. So either false or true. And the elements of the Galton spectrum, which we will define in a second, these are exactly these lambdas. They, they can't do anything else. You get either zero or one. Okay. Um, so here's the, here's the theorem. One of the key theorems. Um, the set of pure states. as sigma a. At different conventions you can find this, you can find omega of a, which I avoid because in the top of we have another important object which is uh, denoted as omega. I go away from this, which is for the general situation for uh, where I set extreme points, pure states. Uh, I denote E of a for the equivalent situation, I get this guy. So, what are these? These are these multiplicative linear functionals. These are pure states. These are algebra homomorphisms from the algebra into the complex numbers. These are the different ways of looking at the elements in there. And this gives you a compact house of space. And 
Well, even at the danger of run, if you have to leave, you, you leave. Yeah, you, you, this is, it would be a shame to stop now. I hope to move a bit faster. Than, it's on the slides anyway. So, um, the big theorem is Galford representation theorem, which tells you uh, following. So, let's write this down. Take an operator A from the algebra A and define A bar as a function from the sigma A from the spectrum of the complex numbers. How do we do this? We say A bar of lambda is to the lambda applied to A. This looks kind of backwards. The first time you see it, this is very surprising, I guess. Just define this function acting on lambda by lambda acting on A. Well, that's okay. That's um, something you can do. And then the statement is the map sent from A into... Okay. First of all, um, part of the statement is here. This is a continuous function. So we actually get a continuous function on the spectrum. Um, those are the functions. This is um, isometric star isomorphism. goes a bit further, but this is already a very important thing. It just says every abelian C star algebra is isomorphic as a C star algebra. This means it's the norm is preserved, that's the one structure we have, and the star is preserved as an isomorphism to continuous functions on its own Galton spectrum. So this is the representation theorem for abelian C star algebras. They all look like the continuous functions on a certain compact house of space and this compact house of space is the so-called Galphon spectrum of the algebra. The result is even stronger when we get the categorical duality, um, categorical equivalence between two things. You have a category of abelian C star algebra. So the objects are abelian C star algebra, the arrows are star homomorphisms. On the other hand you have a category of compact house of spaces the others are continuous functions. And um, I'll write this down in a second. So you can go back and forth and you get um, a contravariant functor in each direction. And going forth and back gives you something which is isomorphic to what you started from. And likewise, going back and forth gives you also something um, isomorphic. So, um, Write this down. It's basically a continuation of this. So um, there is equivalence here is meant in the sense of category theory.
objectability server as arrows star homomorphisms. And okay. How is this uh, is uh, this? check all the details, but I'll give you the idea. You see it's very, very simple. Um, you should know one thing. Um, that is, here we talk about an isomorphism between C star algebras, and here in this second part I concentrate on the relation between A and the compact house of space, that's um, the spectrum, or more generally on compact house of space. So this is not saying exactly the same as above here. So, um, what do we get? Um, call this sketch of a proof is the following. Um, one thing we saw, we saw that every Ethereum C such way gives us a compact host of space. So this is the first, this is the first trunk descending C such was a compact host of space on the level of objects that's happening here. So what happens on the level of arrows if I take a star homomorphism? Um, let phi from A to B be the star homomorphism. This gives us the following thing. Um, gives a continuous function phi bar from the spectrum of B to the spectrum of A, and it's really simple, you just send each lambda here over to lambda after phi. So by pullback. Conversely, um, first we have to get a C star algebra from a compact house of space. That's just the, the object part of the other function. And X is compact. On this space is uh, an Ethereum sister algebra and it, how do I call this, um, from x to y is a continuous function between all the spaces. Central theorems in well function analysis, but I would argue beyond that, it's one of the very few dualities that we have. So that's a very important result, and that's of course um, Galvan duality. So I should write this down. So this map is the Galvan transformation, and this this whole thing is called Galvan duality. And he found it in 1943, I think. As it relates to the, the convolution theory, the Fourier analysis. Not that I'm aware of. Because uh, you're converting kind of uh, composition of operators to uh, pointless multiplication. It could be. I, I, I don't know this, but. Uh, a lot of definitions today and I hope I could give you some idea about these structures and how they generalize from the Hilbert space situation. And most of the stuff we uh, talked about is kind of, of working knowledge that at least implicitly will show up later on. So um, you don't have to know or understand all the details, but you 
come back to this, or if you read the papers if you like, then uh, this is the, the amount of stuff I think is necessary to, to read the papers without too much um, referring back to the literature.